So if you can uh, unshare your screen, great. Share mine and and I will be presenting. Next talk. Um, ah, yes, good. So, um, so my talk will be about a recent result on the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of uncertain stochastic processes. And you will be able to find this presentation at my website, slides.com slash Jan Korbel. And it's related to a recent paper that is uh, posted to archive. I just um, submitted a revised version that is hopefully better to understand. And there are some more examples. So it will appear tomorrow um, and I'm glad if you will go for it. So what is the basic idea? Uh, the basic idea is that in, and this is not only in stochastic thermodynamics, but in any thermodynamic uh, or any system, what we basically do is that we have a, our system of interest. And uh, in case of stochastic thermodynamics, we consider that there is some uncertainty in the states of the system. So basically, if we uh, have a trajectory or we have a set of states, we basically consider that uh, we model it as a through the theory of probability. So there's a probability distribution over the state or over the trajectory uh, of the system, etc. But uh, on the other hand, um, when we take, talk about the system, typically it's coupled to a heat bath or particle bath, or there are some parameters of the system. And in this case, we very often consider that we know these um, parameters like temperature, chemical potentials, etc., cetera, uh, with infinite precision. So basically what we uh, hypothesize is that we know it exactly. But in reality, what an experimenter does is that uh, if we want to make an experiment like that, um, if we want to make an experiment like that, then we try to measure temperature and there is maybe some uncertainty or we prepare the system. And uh, of course the device is not perfect. So, so we prepare the system and the temperature, for example, can slightly change or there are some external, uh, external things that we cannot, um, cannot um, um, affect. So that might, for example, change the temperature of our system or uh, basically, there are there are some some other external things that um, that come into the game, and in this case, uh, there are two very different uh, approaches to the system itself, where we have we acknowledge that there is some uncertainty and we mod cannot model the system deterministically. On the other hand, we require that for the bath and the system parameters, we have to know them exactly, and in our case. Uh, what we considered is that um, as a typical experimenters, as typical experimenters, we do not know the exact value of many things, number of heat baths, temperatures, chemical potentials, energy spectrum or control pro protocols, uh, transition rates, initial distributions. And there might be various reasons for that. Uh, but in general, this is something that is worth investigating also from the practical point of view that there are some uncertainties about the system and its environment. Uh, and let's start a simple example. So let's have a system that has three states and uh, let's say that the system evolves um, stochastically. So there are some transition rates between three states, let's say with different energies, E0, E1, E2. And then we say, we couple the systems to three apparatuses. And these apparatuses uh, affect the exact form of the transition rates. And now the question is, uh, do we know this? Uh, or um, can we somehow say something about the apparatus? Uh, so now we want to measure the distribution at final time. And there are two possible scenarios. So either we have the apparatus 
then we can run the experiment many times. So we run the experiment and we want to measure, for example, a probability distribution at time TF. So what we do is that basically we let, let the experiment run, uh, stop it at TF, measure a position of a particle, repeat the experiment and do it so many times that until we get a decent estimate of the probability distribution. And in case that if we know that the apparatus is uh, the same for each run, then what we can measure is this conditional distribution uh, for, of, for example, energy uh, given, the, given the apparatus. But sometimes we, and this is what we call effective scenario. And then we can do many measurements for the apparatus alpha one, many measurements for apparatus alpha two, many measurements for the apparatus alpha three. Uh, and then for each of these, we can measure this uh, probability distribution. And then if we want, we can also make an average over the apparatuses and uh, make the average value over the, uh, the each apparatus, uh, averaging over the probability distribution of each apparatus. But very often what happens is that we don't know exactly the apparatus and the, each apparatus is randomly cho chosen each time we run the experiment. The temperature slightly changes because the sun is shining on our experiment or there is some air conditioning that changes the temperature, something uh, that we don't know. And then in this case, we can only measure the, let's say the, the average of all the apparatuses at once. And this is what we call phenomenological scenario. And one can think, okay, so in one case I can measure uh, the quantity for each apparatus. In one case, I cannot. But the question is, does it change uh, the experiment? And the answer is yes, it might change the experiment. So, um, because in, in the case where we know that we are coupled to a single apparatus, uh, and uh, then we can adopt our uh, control protocol, for example. So then we can basically adjust the experiment to the conditions we have. So let's say we have a simple uh, example of a uh, moving optical tweezer and uh, the moving optical tweezer has this stiffness function. This is this basically this quadratic potential. And this K is a stiffness. And let's say uh, we want to move the trap from uh, uh, zero to some finite value, lambda F in, in time TF. And we can calculate the optimum protocol and everything uh, let's say we choose the optimal protocol so that it minimizes the average work. And the problem is that if we know the, if we know the, the apparatus, if we know the stiffness, then we can change the protocol for each value of the stiffness. If we do not know this, then we basically measure the stiffness many times. And then we, for example, say, let's measure the stiffness of many times and just use the average value that we have. And we think that this average value is due to the imprecision of the measurement. But the imprecision of in the, it doesn't have to be due to the measurement, but uh, due to the fact that the real stiffness changes in every run. And then one can calculate the, the work in case of the, this we call it adapted scenario, where we can change the protocol for each, uh, for each stiffness and unadapted uh, when we cannot change the protocol and we have to use a single protocol for all cases. And then this is expected uh, that in this case, uh, there is some extra dissipated work that we, have, we, sp we are spending in this unadapted scenario because we cannot uh, adapt our protocol to the, to the, uh, to the environment. So, uh, and, and then uh, the question is, what is then the optimal protocol for this unadapted scenario? Um, and how we can deal with these quantities uh, in this case. So let's start with a simple definition. Uh, let's say we have a set of apparatuses uh, and here we use this, uh, let's say generic, uh, quant generic uh, description apparatus, but it can be really set of temperatures, set of chemical potentials, set of um, whether it's connected, whether the system is coupled to one, uh, um, one reservoir or multiple reservoirs and all of these details. So uh, the only assumption is that in each, uh, in each case for each apparatus, 
uh, let's say that the system satisfies the local detail balance so that we can interpret the quantities from the thermonic point of view. And let's say that we consider a probability distribution over the apparatuses. And then of course, the effective value of any thermonic quantity uh, is basically just the average over all apparatuses. In this case, the effective distribution that can be calculated uh, fulfills this equation. And unfortunately, this is non-Markovian equation. So this is the first complication in our uh, case because the averaging over many apparatuses causes that basically there is a coupling between the probability distribution of an apparatus and probability distribution of the system. So then the evolution is not anymore Markovian in this effective case. Uh, we can uh, investigate the first and second law of thermodynamics. The expected first law of thermodynamics is as, as uh, expected. So basically the change in the internal energy, uh, the effective change is equal to the effective change of the heat and the effective change to the work. Then for the kind of second law, or let's say the, the, uh, the composition of entropy into the entropy production term and entropy flow term, this still works. So there is this expected entropy production that is not negative. The problem is that the expected entropy flow that is normally um, equal to the inverse temperature times the heat flow is uh, not valid anymore because the expected uh, ent entropy flow is the average value over the beta times the Q, which is, this is just for the case of one heat bath. So there is no explicit relation between the entropy flow and the heat flow, um, which is the cornerstone of the second law of thermodynamics. So here the thermodynamic description or interpretation is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so now we were uh, talking about these two uh, uh, scenarios. So basically for the adapted scenario, for each apparatus, we can choose the optimum protocol that minimizes the work. So basically then what we do is that for each uh, apparatus, we choose the optimal protocol that minimizes the work and then we average. And for the unadapted, unfortunately we cannot do that. We, can, we have to use the single protocol. And then of course, the difference between these two things uh, is telling us what is the difference between the, the, the work in the unadapted scenario and the adapted scenario. And uh, basically this is what we can call an extra dissipated work due to this lack of knowledge of apparatus. Uh, um, let's now just uh, uh, focus on a very specific scenario because one of the uh, one of the uncertainties that can be is just the uncertainty about the initial state. So let's say that everything is fixed, everything is known, temperatures are known, uh, temperatures are known, um, chemical potentials are known, everything is known except for the initial distribution. And let's say we have a set of possible initial distributions, uh, and each distribution has some probability to appear. And we let's say we have a distribution that minimizes the expecting the expected work and then we know that uh, any other distribution for any and uh, for any other distribution there is a formula for the dissipated work that is the minimum dissipated work done by this optimal um, by this optimal uh, distribution and there is this drop in the scale of the divergence which is called mismatch cost uh, that that uh, basically um, tells us what is this, this difference between the dissipated work for non-optimal distribution versus the optimal distribution. And uh, one can show um, quite, uh, quite a nice fact, quite interesting uh, fact that this uh, average uh, dissipative uh, work, dissipated work in, in the case where we average over the all possible uh, initial distribution can be calculated as a so-called uh, jensen shannon divergence where we basically take the, all the distributions, uh, weigh them by uh, their uh, probabilities. And this is the KL divergence uh, that takes in as, a, as a, this uh, null model, the average distribution. So then we can uh, easily calculate the dissipated work. Uh, that is just this Jensen-Shannon divergence. 
Uh, last uh, thing I want to talk about is the way that it also in this case we can um, formulate some um, fluctuation, fluctuation terms and we can also decompose the entropy production into two interesting terms. So uh, let us now, now just basically say um, that uh, we are in this case of um, phenomenological approach that where we cannot measure the probabilities for each apparatus, uh, particularly trajectory probabilities, but only the probabilities uh, averaged over all apparatuses. And here we denote the trajectory probabilities as follows. And of course, the effective uh, ensemble and production is the KL divergence between the forward, uh, forward probability of the trajectory versus the backward. So this is the standard, uh, standard result. And by using the chain rule for uh, KL divergence, we can show that this can be decomposed into third term, two terms. So this is the KL divergence over the average probability of the trajectory uh, 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 with respect to the average backward trajectory. And there is a term where the role of this X and alpha is changed. So it's the probability of observing alpha given the trajectory. And Basically, we have now the three types of the entropy production. So one is the effective one, one is the phenomenological one. So this is the effective that is average over the all apparatuses. This is the entropy production over the average trajectories. And this is something that we call, call likelihood entropy production. And if you look at it, it's interesting to see that here in this case, you don't uh, calculate the probability of the trajectory given the apparatus, you are calculating the, uh, the probability of the apparatus given the trajectory. So basically you do the reverse thing. So you are learning about the apparatus from observing the trajectory. And in the case of phenomenological entropy production, you can basically rewrite the, express the KL divergence of this. And in this case, you get the trajectory entropy production, which it's simple to um, show that it uh, fulfills the detailed fluctuation theorem. And of course, the, the um, conclusion from this is that uh, this phenomenological entropy production is the lower bound of the full uh, effective entropy production. So by uh, observing the only the average trajectory probabilities over the all apparatuses, you can estimate the lower bound of the effective entropy production. And uh, for the second quantity, this scale divergence or P alpha given X, you can also uh, calculate the likelihood trajectory of entropy production. And if you look at it, it really looks like a look, log likelihood function that you are trying to calculate the probability of parameters given the trajectory. So this is your data and this is, this is, this is your parameters. And then again, it uh, fulfills a detailed fluctuation theorem and interesting is that from integrated fluctuation theorem, you get a result that the average lambda, this is the average trajectory entropy production, given the trajectory, this is still for one trajectory, is uh, larger or equal one. What it means is that basically the detailed fluctuation theorem tells us how much we learn from observing the forward trajectory versus learning from uh, versus how much we learn from uh, observing the backward trajectory in the, in the backward scenario. So basically uh, it's uh, determining um, the difference between observing the trajectory forward and learning from it and observing the trajectory backwards and learning the parameters from it. Uh, this is one example how it can be calculated. So basically if we have, let's say a distribution of temperatures and we have a simple system of two states, then basically we observe a trajectory and uh, this is, this is uh, sampled from uh, some unknown uh, temperature. So we can then uh, update the, the, uh, the, the probability of temperature observing the trajectory X. Let's say that the, the uh, prior distribution over temperatures is uniform from this zero to three. And then by observing this trajectory, we can calculate the probability of observing T given X. And this is what we get. This is the probability of observing T given the forward trajectory. This is the uh, 
try a probability of observing the temperature uh, given the backwards trajectory, I can calculate the likelihood entropy production. And this is again, given the X and you see that for some temperatures, there is a slightly negative value, but uh, if you calculate the overall value, it's positive. So here it's, it's uh, very much larger than, than uh, zero. Here you see that there are some uh, cases where some temperatures where it is smaller than zero, but it's, it's this, just this small region. And I just want to say that I didn't have time to go through all of the details that are, uh, or all of the results mentioned in the paper. There is also a section on maximum work extraction with un uncertain temperatures. Also dynamics of the thermodynamic value of information when the when there are some uncertain thermodynamic parameters. And there are, this is just a very first step to uh, the whole uh, new field of uh, processes with um, uncertain uh, environments uh, where you can consider systems with uncertain en energy spectra, experiments with uh, uncertain control protocols, uh, extension to time-dependent apparatuses. So basically then you say that your temperature can change in time, but you don't know how. You can have some uh, probabilistic equation on that and you can maybe try to uh, calculate the trajectory probabilities of these temperatures and other things, also extension to hidden Markov models that would be very convenient for several uh, systems. And that's basically all uh, from me. So thank you very much. And now it's time for questions. And I will try to open the list of participants and please raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, uh, Jonathan. Hello. Um, th th thank you for the very wonderful talk. Um, I, I see at the end you're talking about if you have the, the environment is not only uncertain, but it's fluctuating itself mm -hmm. in time. Uh, have you, I was wondering if you thought at all about environment or parameters that not only are they uncertain and fluctuating in time, but but they themselves are affected by the dynamics of the system. Or there would be some sort of mm -hmm. feedback between the two. Of yeah, them. That, that would be another interesting step. Here, I just want to mention that basically the difference between all of this great uh, field of, uh, let's say, time-dependent temperature or time-dependent parameters is the fact that here we consider that we there, there are fixed or can be maybe even time dependent, but we do not know the exact value. So uh, in this case, there would be another great, basically great interplay between the system and the environment where you just know the part of the environment, uh, like the part of that is your system and you, have only some information about the environment, and there can be some uh, some some feedback loop, for example, in this. We haven't considered that. That would be a great uh, future step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there some more questions? Uh, I could have a, I would have a question. Yeah, Peter. Um, so you show these two scenarios, um, right? One scenario, the adaptive mm -hmm. scenario where you know, you measure alpha, you know what it is, and then you carry out the um, optimal protocol for that. And the other is where you only uh, know the average mm -hmm. and then do the work uh, extraction for the average. But I was just wondering, so suppose that you know the distribution of alpha mm -hmm. um, and then you do your experiment uh, mm -hmm. to extract work, for example, is then, uh, but then you're only allowed to choose, let's say, one alpha from that distribution. Mm -hmm. What would yes. then be the optimal alpha? Is that necessarily the average or I, I guess not? Yeah, so so, uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the thing, so that... Uh, what we see typically is that 
choosing just the average is not the optimal it's not the optimal one uh, also uh, it's true for the protocol in, i didn't have the time uh, in the paper we have a simple example of a bit erasure where you basically couple the system to a bath of un, of uncertain temperature and then you choose your protocol that erases your bit and then it shows that the protocol is not simple average of the two protocols also, it's not uh, uh, average of the temperatures or something like that. It's really very complicated and, in general, very difficult to find. Yeah, I can I can understand. Yes, thank you. Clear. Yes. yes. Yep. Um, are there some more questions? Yeah, maybe I can also mention that. That there will be also next interesting step where you don't know the protocol, you observe the trajectory, you try to, uh, to um, estimate the, um, the apparatus, and then you try to change, adapt the protocol uh, regarding to your information you gain from observing the trajectory. And in this case, you would have the feedback loop. And then there would be a natural question, what is the what is the trade-off between observing the trajectory and changing the protocol and this well-known exploration versus exploitation problem from reinforcement learning. That would be a great next, next step. So uh, exactly. Uh, Rohit, what's the next one? Yeah, yeah. I, my question is uh, pretty simple. I didn't understand how you got the non-Markovian feature through averaging. In the beginning, when you were averaging over the effects of all the apparatus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's that, that's the problem. That basically, if you look at this, uh, at this equation, then if if this equation sh would be uh, Markovian, it would be uh, the, on the right hand side. You would have some function, some some transition matrix, some tr rate matrix times the average uh, distribution. Unfortunately. You cannot decouple this integral into the product of the sum rate matrix times the average distribution. So basically, the simply said, the integral of a product is not a product of integrals, and that's why you get this non-Markovian non-Markovianity in general. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, next question by Songila Chen. Hi, uh, my name is Sanjula. Thank you for the Sanjula. talk. Could you repeat um, what was the what what are the apparatuses? Are they just different baths that you can couple to? Yes, or? yes. So so we had this this abstract term for any kind of parameters that you have. It can be uh, temperature of a bath. It can be chemical potential. It can be even the stiffness parameter. Everything that is a parameter of your of your experiment. So then I'm a little confused about what the protocol entails. Is it just like choosing different? Um, so if an apparatus is some parameter, then you're choosing mm -hmm. different apparatuses, meaning you're choosing different parameters in some order, and that's what you call your mm -hmm. protocol? Yeah, and in this case, the protocol means changing the energy spectrum so that you do what you want. And of course, okay. you do it in some way, uh, depending on the parameters, but if you know, do not do, know them, you have to somehow deal with all of these scenarios that might happen. Okay, thank you. And okay, and the last probably question by John. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so if I understand the uncertainties that you're considering are, are all parametric in the sense that I have a stiffness of a potential and I don't know, yes, yes. Have, have you thought about um, kind of less structured uh, types of uncertainties, like maybe I have a potential and it's almost parabolic, but, you know, differs a little bit in shape. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so for example, you have a you have a class of potentials and they are parametrized. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's always that you can parametrize them somehow, or this is the typical approach that you you somehow label them if you want. And in our case, it can be discrete, it can be continuous, both of them. So basically you have some set of these, let's say potentials or apparatuses, and then you somehow average over them. Uh, and 
this goes a little bit into your direction of stochastic control protocol. Be interesting to see how this whole business changes when you don't know the parameters exactly and you have some uncertainty about them. Great. So thank you. I think we are uh, going to the next talk. So thank you again. Uh, and the next uh, speaker is Aliash uh, from Max Planck Institute and uh,